one of China's top virologists, so-called Batwoman Xi Jingli, predicts that another coronavirus outbreak is likely in the future. Not only that, but she and her colleagues at the Wuhan lab found 20 highly risky coronavirus species. The South China Morning Post reported on Xi's findings, published back in July in the English language journal Emerging Microbes and Infections. But the paper only started circulating on Chinese social media this month. An unnamed source told the outlet that one of the reasons Chinese authorities are downplaying COVID-19, including these findings, is because they want to move on, especially after the abrupt reversal of China's zero COVID policies. According to the same source, some cities have stopped releasing infection, infection data altogether. OK, so this is the woman who did a lot of the uh, research on viruses that hop from bats to humans. That's why she's been nicknamed Bat Lady, and apparently there are dozens of these uh, diseases that they were working on, and so there's this likelihood, she's saying, that another one of these might escape and become a pandemic. I'm struggling with what the implications of this are because the public, at least in America, is divided on the issue of COVID in some respects, but very united on the idea that it's over, it's not a big deal, the government shouldn't act to intervene in any way. So is this something that we should be afraid of? Or are we all now inured to the idea that, oh, it's just like the flu, maybe another million people are gonna die, but people die and they're old people mostly. So meh. I mean, what, what are we even taking from this at this point? And, and Well, and I don't know either because there's really no indication in this reporting of if this is as deadly as the original coronavirus was when it got to the United States, if it's as contagious. That hasn't really been indicated here. So I don't know is the answer. Um, if anything, I think what's going to come out of this is the potential for politicians in the U.S. and probably public health officials to use this as a means to go back and re-debate whether or not our policies the first time around worked at all in slowing the pandemic, which they objectively did not. So, what, so then what do you take from that? It is true. I don't even know what the number is. It was it was a million people who were dead before Biden even became president. So who even knows what the ultimate, I mean, I could obviously sit here and Google what the ultimate number was. But even that number is disputed, right? There are many people who say if someone had COVID and then they also died of something else in surgery or in a car accident or whatever, their deaths are recorded as COVID. So you can't even really have a conversation about what the human costs really were. I, it feels like people are very happy with the idea that there should be almost no pandemic response. There's very little to no confidence in the CDC. There seems to be no sense that there, we should have a public health infrastructure in the least because the perception is that it has such an inclination to be authoritarian and that it could get things wrong, that it's not even worth trying. Is that really the space we want to be in? The next virus could be more dangerous. It could be more infectious. It could be more lethal. We have experienced other uh, health crises like monkeypox, where it was only a crisis because we decided not to pay a million dollars or whatever it was to make sure that we had the the um, vaccines on hand. They had all expired, and we just decided as a society that we're probably not going to have a monkeypox issue, so let's just not replace them. And then it became a little mini crisis as we rushed to manufacture them in time to stop the spread. You know, do, are we really saying that we don't want to have any kind of preventative measures in place, whether it's having certain kind of equipment manufactured here at home so we don't aren't subject to the supply chain crisis around respirators or masks or protective gear? Or are we saying we so are fresh, we're so fresh with what the government did last time that we're happy to just have a free for all, every man for himself, if something else strikes the country? I think the problem is that Americans haven't seen a concerted effort to make sure that what happened doesn't happen again. The people who were in charge of it were not held accountable for the decisions that they made that led to a, a lot of loss of life, particularly with the nursing home scandals mm -hmm. in New York and in Pennsylvania. And they see these leaders actually getting promoted. I mean, in the case of Rachel Levine, right? I mean, this individual was in charge of the pandemic health response in Pennsylvania and then was promoted to rear admiral after doing the exact same thing with nursing homes that Governor Cuomo did. Um, and, and with Fauci, I mean, he retires and he gets his full pension despite having really 
sketchy connections with Chinese officials before declaring that he was quite sure that COVID didn't leak from a lab, that it was naturally occurring. Um, so that's why I think people still have so much skepticism and distrust of the public health establishment. And when we go back and look at you know, what happened there, I, I, I think everybody, at least on the conservative side, who was skeptical of what they were doing was, was waving the warning flag of this is going to have disastrous, disastrous effects for future health crises because you're going to have this distrust. And so we have to make sure that people are held accountable. And I think in this case, if we were to have another coronavirus pandemic, my response would be, let's make sure that we have therapeutics on hand for early intervention, because that was mm -hmm. one of the big mistakes of the last response was that people were dissuaded from taking therapeutics. They were told to wait for the vaccine. They were put on the ventilators, which were, I think, shown to, to prove that actually it made people's health conditions quite worse when they were suffering from the late stages of a coronavirus infection. And if we're gonna do lockdowns, they need to be targeted to the most vulnerable because the effects on people who were otherwise healthy, did not have these comorbidities, were awful from both an economic standpoint, from a mental health standpoint, and from a health standpoint. Because yeah. we had people who were told not to go get cancer screenings because they didn't want anyone besides COVID patients in the hospital. Um, so let's let's go to what, I don't know, Dr. Scott Atlas, Atlas was talking about in the Trump administration. He was proved right on a lot of what he said, which was let's have lockdowns for elderly people, people who have comorbidities, people who have immunocompromised uh, you know, symptom or immunocompromised diseases and tell them that they should stay home, they should be protected, they should protect themselves. People who, if they get the virus, are gonna suffer the flu or cold should probably get it early so that they can develop natural immunity, which has been proven stronger than the immunity that you're given by a vaccine. And if they do end up having side effects, then they should go get a therapeutic. Yeah, I mean, I, I do agree that there needed to be more targeting um, of the most vulnerable. I mean, we saw in Florida, which had you know more COVID deaths, particularly because of uh, Ron DeSantis' policies with respect to old, or old people's homes, uh, elderly ho folks' homes, was a disastrous from a, was disastrous from a policy perspective. So I completely agree with that. But I think we live in a country where if we said people who work in nursing homes have to be masks, masked, or people who work in nursing homes have to have vaccines, or people who visit nursing homes needed to be masked and vac vaccinated, you would get a percentage of this country who would be very angry about that, despite it being exactly the vulnerable populations that we're talking about. And what if we are we do have people in the workforce? who are older or who are diabetic or who are immunocompromised or who have asthma or who have any number of factors. Sometimes we talk about people who are uniquely vulnerable. So that's not a significant portion of the American population. Are we going to then be in a place where we're willing to say, OK, in the interest of protecting our fellow human beings, we are going to require, we're all going to mandate either lockdowns of certain populations or vaccine or masking requirements of certain populations. You know, are we going to be in a place where we're open to in hospitals where many people are vulnerable by nature of being in a hospital and have no choice to just avoid the hospital because they need treatment, that we need medical staff members to mask and people in the hospitals to mask? There's been a lot of pushback against even those kinds of notions. So I'm a little skeptical that there's like a common sense mentality that says, well, we can target it the ne at the next time. I do think the public perception is we just don't want anything to be done that has any kind of government backing behind it or any requirement. Am I, am I being overly cynical? Uh, maybe not. I mean, I think on the mask question particularly, that's a little bit more difficult because there hasn't been a great study showing that they work super well, particularly with the way people in America wear masks or the type of masks that I they wear. I think that's wear. true. The type of mask if and you're, compliance look, are huge issues. I, I genuinely think if you said people in hospitals who are working with patients who are vulnerable have to wear N95s properly. Mm -hmm. I really don't think there would be major pushback on that. I don't. I think the issue is it's not just that people are people in the hospital who work in the hospital. If I go to the hospital because I'm sick, it's the question of whether I have to take my mask off to do a respiratory test. I have mm -hmm. to take my mask off to 
get my tonsils looked at or whatever right. it is. The patients have to take their masks off. So the one-way masking logic doesn't work so well. Fair. So then what? Am, are people going to be okay? If I go to a hospital with a broken leg and you go into the hospital with a respiratory issue, are you going to be okay with me saying, I don't want to wear a mask, even though you have to take your mask off and be exposed to whatever I've tracked in? I mean, these are the kinds of questions. And I, I, don't, like, I understand the public distrust. I understand the public frustration. I understand the, the flip-flopping on the mask issue, the confusion around the quality level of the masks and the compliance. I see people with big, hairy beards wearing even... In 95s, I'm like, of course that doesn't work. Your your mask right. is sitting three inches off of your face. So there's there's so much that I think has warranted the lack of public trust. But I am concerned, and I've been saying this to Robbie, I've been saying this throughout, that some of the libertarian mindedness is talking people into a place where you're going to be really abandoned, and this is not the last time a pandemic is going to happen. And I think that. If, if it were me, I'd be wanting to get the government to correct its mistakes, not to have a, but not to have a hands-off approach. I do think that there's some truth to the fact, though, that the people who are best prepared to determine their risk level is themselves. Like, people know about their own illnesses. They know whether they're immunocompromised. They know if they have a comorbidity. And I think that man, the mandates really, I think, upset people from a from the libertarian freedom standpoint that you mentioned, because it didn't allow them the amount of freedom that they needed to make risk decisions for themselves. And I'll give you an example, okay? Sure. So like my grandparents, my grand, my grandmother just turned 80 years old. My grandfather, I think is like 85, maybe he's 87, somewhere in that range, right? They're old. And uh, early in the pandemic, my birthday came up. It was June 1st of, in 2020. And they came over and we had a backyard barbecue and we had this plan where they were gonna sit socially distanced away from everybody else. They were gonna sit in their lawn chairs over in the corner. And they kept inching closer. And we were like, what are you guys doing? And then we, they'd go inside to get more potato salad and they would not have put their mask back on. And we were so frustrated because at that time, it was still early days, mm -hmm. right? People didn't really know what things were working and what and what uh, which ones weren't. And they wanted to make the decision for themselves. I'm gonna die of something, whether it's COVID or just me being 85 years old. And I want the opportunity to be able to sit next to my granddaughter and, and my family members without wearing a mask. And I want them to see my smile. And if I get COVID, then I'm okay with that. And I, I think the government response didn't give people that opportunity to make those decisions Samantha, for themselves. you're telling a story about how you were, in fact, able to make those decisions during the pandemic. Yeah, and we, we broke the, the rules. But that's, that's, that's why I really, I'm sorry, the words lockdown and stuff, it's, it becomes absurd. No, we people were in were, China. Mothers were we arrested were for taking their people. kids to okay, the park. You, I mean, it's cra it was crazy. There were silly barricades put up around parks and outdoor spaces. I would never dispute that that stuff in retrospect was ridiculous, but to your point, that's in retrospect. Even you at the time were concerned about what the proximity of your grandparents meant. And there was no mandate that said that you and the company of your home could put your hands on your hips and hack germs straight into your grandmother's mouth if that's what you wanted but to do. But there were restrictions about the number of people that you could have in your home. There were restrict there were all kinds of restrictions Acting as like though that there from were the government. There was Gestapo coming around telling you you couldn't convene in your own house. It's just there a were representation three, of what actually happened. There were literally happened. neighbors calling the cops on each other for having guys, too many people at a party. It was Did that happen to you? Did you witness that? It didn't happen to me. Or was this one there of those reports? cat litter box in the no, in, in elementary school no, bathroom there stories? There are legitimate reports about the way that neighbors were snitching on each other, the way that if you, you go to, I mean, perfect example, the park example. If you're a mother who takes her kid to the park and you go under the police rope or the caution tape and a policeman literally comes up and threatens to arrest you but in front of your child. People shouldn't snitch. People snitch on each other for noise complaints every day. People call the cops on each other for all but kinds that's of why the man that's why the mandates are, are fundamentally are awful because you're saying like, oh, people break the rules all the time. But we do live in a society where no, there are I, a look, lot of people if, who if tell on each other. you're telling me there was a rule that was a violation of the law for people to be uh, over a certain number of people per square footage in a house. I never saw that. I've never heard yeah, of that. Yeah, it was like six people at one if, point. If you, especially in, in major cities like San no, Francisco. No, in your own and, home. Yes, correct. No, there's no way they can enforce that because more than people just live in their houses. There's families that are bigger than six people. Right, it was just people live outside in their of your immediate household was the okay. regulation. If you demonstrate <laughs> to me that that was ever enforced, I, I can sit here and say, obviously, I don't yeah. think that that should be enforced. But using a story like that, 
as that that shields the government from any responsibility if there is another global pandemic that kills literally millions of people, just be careful what you wish for. Look, and That's I've, all I'm I've, saying. I've conceded that I want a public health response. I'm just explaining. You're not going to get one. Well, and <laughs> you're I'm, not going to get one. And I'm explaining. Because everyone's and that, decided and that's they don't want one. Well, and and what I'm saying is that the people who were responsible for things like that need to be held accountable and removed from the public I think health that's bureaucracy. Fine. I think that's fine. Before but, people trust them but you've again. You've got the Republican candidates all saying, well, let's just defund the CDC altogether. And that's my only question. I'm happy for Fauci. I don't care if he is found criminally liable and thrown in jail. I don't, I'm not, I don't have an investment in any of these people. I think that people should be accountable for their mistakes. What I don't think is that we should live in a libertarian <laughs> hellscape where we're all shuttered in our houses by choice because if we go outside, we could die and there's no one who's going to come and help. Well, I'm not a libertarian, so I'm not going to argue with you on that point. I don't want a libertarian hellscape either. But. All right. I'm glad we can yeah. come to that. <laughs> all right. Stick around. We have more rising right after this.